joy to the world the Lord is come let earth receive her King let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and
have shown a holy light Sing and go Tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere I go Tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born The shepherds fear and tremble trivia I, that probably wasn't the name of it but uh, you know there were contestants and there would be a bunch of Bible questions and stuff and and I remember one particular Wednesday night you know it was brought up because uh, we'd seen it like it had been on the program like Monday or Tuesday or something like that and somebody in the Wednesday group said uh, brother John did you know the answers to those questions and I said yes and I was about to follow up and say now a couple of times I had to think about it and then they would say the answer and I would you know, but as soon as I said yes, there was a man in the group that said, "No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You know, I had just said I knew all the answers. He said, "No, you didn't. How would you feel? Enraged, angry? You bet I was angry. And I called him out on it. I said, "Do you realize what you just did? You just called me a liar. It was like, he hadn't thought of that. But yeah. Do you realize that people can call God a liar? You know, it's a little more dangerous to call God a liar than it is to call a budgie preacher a liar. And that's exactly what happens when people don't believe the truth that God has spoken about his son. Now, the text is going to be... Mark chapter 16 and when I finally get to Mark chapter 16 we're almost done okay but I want to give you something from 1st John chapter 5 
where God the Father shows various things about his son to proclaim to the world, this really is my son who came on mission and gave his life on Calvary's cross and rose from the dead, and you need to be saved by believing him. Listen to 1 John 5, the last part of verse 10. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. In other words, God Almighty says, I am going to give you evidence that this Jesus of Nazareth really is my son and that he really has come on mission and has really laid his life down and I, he's come back to where he was before and now you need to believe him and if you don't believe you have called me God a liar I want to read it again the one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son there are prophecies about his son that Jesus fulfilled it was God's way of saying, now when he gets here, you're going to recognize him because of what these prophecies have said. Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, he has to be a descendant of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 49, he has to be from the tribe of Judah. There were 12 tribes of Israel, sons of Jacob. There were 12 tribes, and the tribe of Judah was the tribe that the Messiah was to come from. <clears throat> he had to be a descendant of David, who was from the tribe of Judah. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where the one who is going to reign forever is going to be a descendant of David. That's what God told King David. He had to be from the city of David. You understand that David was from Bethlehem. He was the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. Say Bethlehemite three times. No, don't do that. But you trace him. And so it says in the city of David, Bethlehem was where Jesus was born. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says that the one who will rule the people is from Bethlehem and his goings forth have been from of old even from everlasting and so that's a prophecy concerning Jesus it's prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7 that he would be virgin born it's prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53 that he would take the sins of the world upon himself and that he would lay his life down as a guilt offering for mankind and then take it back up again. It's prophesied in Psalm chapter 16 that he would not see corruption, that he would go back to the Father before his body broke down and Jesus was raised on the third day. Psalm chapter 11, uh, chapter 16. And so all of those things are prophecies concerning his son. But then in addition to that, what did Jesus say? when there were Pharisees and scribes that didn't believe that he was who he said he was. Listen to John 5, 36. The works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. Now they followed him around for three years trying to find something wrong with him. And so when he would do signs and wonders that only God in the flesh could do, they saw that and observed that. And don't forget that even in the very last week of his life here on earth, he had raised Lazarus from the dead, who had been dead for four days. And they didn't deny that he did that. But instead they said, we've got to do something about that. Everybody's going to follow him, and the Romans are going to come and take away our place and our name. So belief has something to do with your will. And God is pretty well saying, I have given you clear testimony about who my son is, and I expect you to believe me. If you don't believe me, you've called me a liar. Romans 1.4 says that Jesus was declared to be the son of God in power by the resurrection from the dead. The signs and the wonders that he did and his resurrection and he appeared and he was seen by witnesses and yet there were two of those who were followers of Jesus believers and they were on their way to the Emmaus road and and Jesus you know appeared to them and he was in a different form where they couldn't recognize him and 
And he said, what have you been talking about? And they said, oh, we've been talking about, you, aren't you from around here? You know, uh, this Jesus who was mighty in word and deed, and we considered him a great prophet, and he was going to deliver Israel from bondage, and, and he was put to death. And then some women came and said that he'd been resurrected, and, and then uh, Peter claims to have had him appear to him, and, and boy, we just don't know what to think about that. And here's what Jesus said. Foolish men, slow of heart to believe. In all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter his glory? How much does it take for you to believe? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of Nathaniel. Nathaniel was sitting under a fig tree, and his brother Philip came to him, and or no, his friend Philip came to him and said, we've seen the Messiah, et cetera, et cetera, and... and then later, Nathaniel appeared before Jesus, and Jesus said, Oh, a true Israelite, no falsehood. And Nathaniel, how do you know me? Well, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathaniel said, That's enough for me to believe. You're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because you've seen that. Out of boy, Nathaniel. But you believe because you've seen that, you're going to see greater things. So, unbelief never has enough evidence. Because unbelief is an act of the will. Because if you believe, you're going to change. And people don't like change. People like to stay the way they are. Especially if there's some kind of sinful activity that we don't want to turn from. That's why any true faith has repentance involved in it. It's not that you straighten your life out and then come to Jesus. But you come to Jesus in faith with the understanding that his spirit is going to invade your life and he's going to bring about changes. And so that's one of the things that I can say about my life. I can remember when I was mm, eight years old, you know, I had a Sunday school teacher that said, now if you don't get saved and you die today, you're going to go to hell, so don't you think you ought to go to the front and get saved? And, oh, well, yeah, I don't want to go to hell. So I went to the front and I sat down and I thought I got saved and I didn't, you know. There wasn't any repentance. I didn't ask God to do anything. And then when I was 14 at Falls Creek, it was like, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I need to be forgiven. I, I, I need to get my life right with God. There was faith expressed in Jesus Christ, and there was also a desire for a new life. And so that's what we're talking about. If you really put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is going to save you, but he's also he's going to mess with you. His Spirit is going to come and dwell you. The Spirit of God is going to use the Word of God to convict you of behavior that you need to change and instruct you on how to live the righteous life and to help you grow spiritually and become more and more like Christ. You will change. May I ask the believers in this place, those that have really placed their faith in Jesus Christ, how many of you regret the fact that you did that? None. There's no such thing as a person who really places his faith in Jesus Christ who says, well, I wish I hadn't done that. Have you been changed? Oh, yeah. Are the changes bad? All he does is help you get your life together. A life that's abundant is what he promised, the abundant life, John 10.10. 10. Doesn't have to do with a lot of riches and a lot of comforts and a lot of pleasures, but it has a whole lot to do with purpose and meaning. And the fruit of the Spirit, let's see, the last time I checked, peace and joy were pretty good things. And when a believer submits himself to the absolute lordship of Jesus where the Holy Spirit fills him, love and joy and peace, are those really bad? Patience and kindness and goodness, wouldn't you want somebody to work for you that's got those things that describe him? And faithfulness and self-control. You think Americans could use a good dose of self-control? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> part of the issue was there was unbelief in spite of the fact that the evidence was clear. And I believe about the worst was when the disciples didn't believe what the women said and they had trouble believing what the men from uh, Emmaus said. And then when Jesus actually appeared in the midst of them, there were 10 of the 11. 
and Jesus castigated them for their unbelief. And when Thomas, who was not there, was with the remaining 10, and they said, we have seen the Lord, he said, I'm not going to believe you till I reach inside his hand where the wounds are and reach inside his side. And Jesus appeared at a later time, and here's what he said to Thomas. Now, Thomas, because you've seen, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believed. 21st century believers in Jesus Christ, that's you. You haven't seen the resurrected Lord. You, you haven't seen Jesus after he made his appearances. But you have the report of those who have. And God says in his word, blessed are those who have not seen yet believed. And he also says, you've got enough evidence. The question is, do you want to believe? Do you want to believe? Now, I <laughs> haven't read the passage yet, but, and it's about the resurrection. If Jesus really is resurrected, you need to do something about it. And so, if you don't want to do something about it, place your faith in the resurrected Lord then you need to find some way of explaining away the resurrection if he's really resurrected and I don't do anything about it I'm in deep trouble so either I do something about it or I try to find some explanation that says he's really not resurrected and there have been some doozies and of course the favorite was the one that the unbelieving Jews came up with in, in the first century that the disciples came along and stole the body and hid the body and then claimed that he was raised from the dead. Now I want you to understand that God knows what these arguments are going to be and he's taken care of those things ahead of time before the arguments ever came along. First of all, I'm, hopefully nobody here has ever tried to hide a dead human body. Have you noticed that you can't hide a dead mouse? After four days, there's a dead mouse somewhere. Try hiding a human body and nobody finding it. But, and so in other words, the disciples hid the body and then they lied and said that he's resurrected. You know, there are people that would die for, for a lie that they believe to be the truth, right? I mean, people are doing that today. Dying for a lie that they believe to be the truth. But what if you know that you're lying? Would you die for that? If you know that you're lying and somebody says you're lying and you back off from that lie or I'm going to kill you, would, would you back off from the lie? I'm old enough to remember Watergate. And there were seven men that broke into the Democratic headquarters. They were involved in Nixon's re-election campaign. And they were... Uh, bugging the phones and they were stealing documents and they got caught and the seven lied and said they weren't guilty of any kind of wrongdoing and then came along you know you're going to go to jail you know you're going to go to prison and five of them rather than go to prison admitted that they were lying and two of them rather than go to prison admitted they were lying and they still did some prison time but all seven of them backed off of a lie that they knew that they were perpetuating to save their hide. What did the, what did the disciples do? They were martyred. They said, we can't help but speak the things that we've seen and heard. Jesus is risen. He's the crucified and risen Lord, and we proclaim him. And if you kill us, that's not going to change. And they did. There was only one who was not martyred, and that was John. And they tried and failed, and so they exiled him. But 10 of the remaining 11 were put to death. So was it for a lie that they knew was a lie, or was it that they knew the truth and they had the responsibility? You can't hide a dead body successfully, and in addition to that, nobody is going to die for something that they know to be a lie. Another thing is that Jesus swooned. This is a favorite of mine. You know, that he wasn't really dead. 
that he swooned. Well, God took care of it ahead of time, didn't he? The apostle John said, well, you know, when they were going to break his legs, they realized that he was already dead. And just to make sure, they thrust a spear into his side, and blood and water came out. Now, it wasn't blood and water. It was what John saw that looked like blood and water. What had happened? His blood had clotted, and the blood and the serum had separated from each other. And so blood and water is, he's dead. There's the clots and the serum. John didn't say clots and serum because he didn't live in the 21st century. But he's saying he was dead. What had happened to him before he was crucified? He'd been scourged. And then blood and water came out. And then what happened? In Mark 15 and then in a couple of other passages, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came along and wrapped his body with 75 pounds of goo, myrrh and aloes, so that when he finally started stinking, he wouldn't smell quite as bad, and put a napkin over his face. And then a huge stone was rolled in front of the tomb. The stone was usually a round disc, and it was uh, limestone and weigh about a ton, sometimes a little more than a ton. And when the women came to the tomb, they were going, who's going to move the stone for? But according to the swoon thing, Jesus revived inside the tomb, wrapped in 75 pounds of goo with a napkin over his face. Wouldn't he have smothered? And he gets up and he moves from the inside a one ton or maybe more than that round disc of limestone and walks out. Whew. Well, it takes a lot of faith to believe that. By the way, this is something that occurred to me this week, and this is just kind of a little detail thing. But... You, you roll it over the face of the tomb, over the face of the cave, and so it overlaps on the outside. It doesn't overlap on the inside. So what would he have had to do? Get up and push that thing over and then pick it up and move it. By the way, to get it to, to roll down in front of the tomb, you would have it already in position uphill, and you would roll it downhill. And so in order for him to get out and move that thing, he had to get out and push it uphill. One ton, no blood, covered with 75 pounds of goo and a napkin on your face. God took care of that ahead of time. And then there's the wishful thinking theory. Theory, I shouldn't have used theory. Conjecture. The wishful thinking thing that they just wanted so bad for him to be alive that they were hallucinating that he was really alive. And he appeared in the upper room and said, touch me, touch me. But in addition to that, how many appearances? There are 10 different examples of his appearing to people in the New Testament. And in one of those, the apostle Paul, who was not a believer until Jesus appeared to him, and he became the, the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. Paul said, 500 people at one time saw Jesus after he'd resurrected. 500 people hallucinating. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir this morning with a lot of y'all. It's like, preacher... <laughs> I believed in the resurrection before I came in here, and now you're trying to convince me of something that I already believe. How about I'm giving you ammunition? How about it's okay to use the word stupid? I mean, it's really stupid not to believe in the resurrection. It goes against logic. There's also the, quote, theory that there really wasn't a Jesus of Nazareth, that that was something that was concocted by the church. And yet, unbelieving historians, unbelieving legislators have written letters here and there, like the works of Josephus, who was a Jew who didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Uh, Pliny the Younger, who was uh, uh, a Roman leader who wrote things about this cult of Christian people. And here's what they would say. Over and over, first century historians and writers, there was this Jesus who was a mighty teacher and mighty indeed and did some miraculous things and he was executed by the Romans and his followers 
claim that he is back to life and they worship him as God. That was from unbelievers. Yeah, there really was a Jesus who walked across the pages of history and was really crucified on purpose and rose from the dead. A dead Jesus can't save anybody. But a resurrected Jesus can save anybody who calls on him. Now the passage. Thank you for not saying, yay, he's almost done. Okay. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 14. And before I read it, I want you to understand that with the oldest manuscripts, Mark stopped at verse 8. Okay? But picking up with verse 9 are things that are in other gospel writers' accounts. Matthew and Luke and John all give an account of these particular things. But long about the 1200s, some of the translators would go, well, you know what? Mark ended it so abruptly. Let's put what we know to be true from the other gospel writers and let's end the book of Mark a little more gracious, gracefully. And so it's not that verses 9 through 14 that we're going to deal with today actually didn't happen, but it's that Mark himself didn't write that. But you get to about the, the year 1200 and they started putting that in there saying, you know, Matthew and Luke and John all give an account of these particular things. These things are true, and so that's, it's there. It's just not Mark. Got it? Do you really care? <laughs> in other words, we need to know what this says. And I want you to notice the unbelief and ask yourself, was this wishful thinking when they finally said Jesus has risen? They didn't think he had. They didn't think he had. Here we go. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. Why did they single out Peter? Because Peter had denied him three times and was feeling like scum. And it was like, be sure and encourage Peter. Okay. Go and tell the disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And he had said that before he was ever crucified. Now I'm going to be spat upon. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to rise on the third day. And then I'm going to appear to you at, in Galilee. Okay. So they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they had said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, that's where all the old manuscripts of Mark end. But we've talked about scribal glosses before, where a scribe knows something to be true, knows something to have happened, and sometimes they'd write it out in the margin. And by the time we get to the year like 1200, it becomes a part of the text. But you will notice, in the interest of honesty, you probably got a bracket, or you've got a footnote. It says, you know, the oldest manuscripts don't have this in Mark. But is this in the Bible in other places? Yes, it is. All right. Now, after he'd risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused. Notice, refused to believe it. It's an act of your will. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them. That's the guys on the road to Emmaus. While they were walking along on their way to the country, they went away and reported to the others, but they did not believe them either. <laughs> Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves, the ten first, and then to the total eleven. As they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him 
after he had risen. The disciples put it this way to the unbelieving Jewish leadership. We cannot help but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In Mark chapter 3, talked about the calling of the 12, and it said he called those 12 to be with him and then go out to proclaim. They saw all the miracles, they heard all the teaching, they saw the righteous life, they encountered the resurrected Christ. And it says in Acts chapter 1 that for 40 days he appeared at different times and gave them instructions about the kingdom and showed them proofs that could not be argued against. God has borne witness of his son and he who does not believe in God's account of his son calls God a liar. Not a good idea. Let's take some time to meditate. And if you have not accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, Jesus didn't go to the cross to make it difficult where you had to have an IQ of 140 to be saved. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I won't cast them out. Whoever hears my words and believes has everlasting life and won't be condemned, but has passed from death into life. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? It's supposed to be. Jesus did the hard part. The simple thing is, are you willing to let Jesus come into your heart, change your life? Call on him and ask him to forgive you and save you and invite him to come into your heart. And he says... He will. He promises. Whoever comes to me, I will not cast them out. That's a wonderful promise. I knock at the door. Whoever opens their heart's door, I will come in. That's a promise from God who cannot lie and cannot fail. So let's pray for just a moment. And I want to give you an opportunity, if you've not been saved, to call out to Jesus and ask him to come into your heart. Pray something like this. Jesus, I, I know I've sinned. And I'm sorry for my sins. And I know that if you come into my heart, changes will take place. I'm asking you to save me. I'm asking you to come into my heart and change my life. Is it that simple? Yep. It sure is. It's the greatest promise that mankind ever encountered. It's the greatest gift that's ever been offered that we who have sinned against God can be forgiven and inhabited by His Spirit and adopted in His family. Wow. Welcome to the family of God if you prayed that prayer. We have a deacon and some staff here at the front and myself. Come talk to us about the decision that you've made. Now also, those of us that have been believers for a while, hmm, is there anything in your life that you're not believing God for? Is there some area of your life that you're, you're controlling it yourself and you don't want him to mess with it? It's time to repent of that as an act of your will. God, I'm going to trust you with that. So we'll meditate for a little while, and if you need to talk to somebody, we'll be here for you. God bless. Run to the Father, fall into grace, and done with the hiding. Search and soul need to pray.